Eudora Welty achieved literary acclaim throughout her life, compiling a list of achievements including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the French Legion of Honor, and a Pulitzer Prize in Fiction for the Optimist's Daughter. She spent the vast majority of her long life in her home state of Mississippi, where she forged her identity as one of the most important Southern writers in American literature. Welty comes from an unassuming background. She was born in 1909 and raised in a comfortable middle-class home with supportive parents, Christian, an insurance broker, and Chestina. Eudora re remained unmarried and lived in her childhood home for much of her life. Although her family life seems ordinary, it, it had clear impacts on Eudora's later work. Many of these impacts may be largely attributed to Eudora's father, Christian, who kept the family home while stocked with literature and exposed Eudora to photography as a child. She later attended the University of Wisconsin, where she earned a bachelor's degree. She then attended Columbia Business School for one year, but returned to Jackson when her father became ill and died. Walty's father died at a young age, but his impact on Eudora's path was long-lasting. Walty also found inspiration in many figures other than her father, including many modern fiction writers such as Virginia Woolf and William Faulkner. She found a more directly personal mentor in Catherine Ann Porter, who then wrote the introduction to her first short story collection, a Curtain of Green in 1941. Welty is known as a Southern writer, and her stories are Southern to their cores, but Welty rejected the notion that she was a regional writer, because she wrote from her own localized experiences rather than a regional perspective. Welty does recognize the prevalence of a strong sense of place throughout Southern literature, however, which is largely crucial in her own body of work as well. Welty accepts that she is very much a Southern writer, and she only rejects the term in that she emphasizes the individuality of Southern writers rather than collective patterns among them. Some of the features of Welty's body of work include a strong sense of place, colloquial dialogue, and impeccably crafted satiric humor. She infused her life with this humor, and it made its way into her friendships. One of Eudora's notable friendships was with the author Reynolds Price, who Eudora mentored in much the same way that Catherine Ann Porter mentored her. Eudora did not believe in a strict definition of Southern literature, but she helped to continue the tradition of great Southern writers through sustained mentoring relationships with these young writers. Prior to her writing career and instrumental to its development, Welty pursued her love of photography, which was passed down to her by her father. Welty's photography largely focused on capturing the effects of the Great Depression on her community as a whole, and her subjects generally consisted of working class African Americans. Welty said of her photography, I learned in the doing how ready I had to be. Life doesn't hold still. A good snapshot stopped a moment from running away. Photography taught me that to be able to capture transience by being able to click the shutter at the crucial moment was the greatest need I had. The styles of Eudora Welty's photography and writing are largely different, but the prominence of the need to capture a moment accurately and from the correct angle may be found in both mediums. Parallels may also be drawn between the subjects of interest to Eudora and the two forms of work. These photographs from a fair relate to elements from within a petrified man. The advertisement of the mule-faced woman is mirrored when Leota refers to Thelma's customer as old horse face. While his insistence on capturing moments in literature as she did in photography can be seen in this passage from a petrified man. Oh, well, honey, talking about being pregnant and all, you ought to see those twins in a bottle. You really owe it to yourself. What twins? asked Mrs. Fletcher out of the side of her mouth. Well, honey, they got these two twins in a bottle, see? Boyne jo joined plumb together. Dead, of course. Leota dropped her voice into a soft, lyrical hum. They was about this long. Pardon. Must have been full time, all right, wouldn't you say? And they had these two heads and two faces and four arms and four legs, all kind of joined here. See, this face looked this away, and the other face looked that away, over the shoulder, see? Kind of pathetic. One of the first important elements of this passage is the repetition of C and prominence of the idea of sight. The story is largely occupied with the idea of appearances. It's set in a beauty parlor and the women are obsessed with the physical appearance of each person they discuss. The insistence on repetition of the word C while Leota is giving a detailed visual description suggests that perhaps there is something more to see beyond the surface appearance of the twins that Mrs. Fletcher is in grasping. The C, 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 C in this passage begins to feel like a plea to look beyond the visual level and see something deeper, and the inclusion of looked this away and looked that away furthers this idea of seeing beyond the surface level in that these sections imply a search. What could Leota be trying to look beyond? 
The answer to this is probably the appearance of the twins, based on the fact that they are the subjects of description within the passage on display for everyone to view. Several elements within the description of the twins warrant further evaluation. The first of these is the use of the word plum. One reading of plum together is utterly or completely together, which simply references the conjoined twin state. Plum also means completely vertical, however, which implies that the twins are suspended vertically in the bottle rather than horizontally laying down in the natural position for infants and for the deceased. This implies that perhaps the most unnatural thing is the, is the treatment of the twins rather than their infliction. A third reading of plum is based on the pronunciation of the word. Phonetically, one would read plum as the fruit, which is ripe, sweet, and carries strong reproductive connotations because it houses the seeds of a plant. Coupled with the use of honey, images of nature in the beginnings of the life cycle appear. The use of born earlier in the sentence initially reinforces this idea, but the sentence reads, born joined plum together, dead of course. Death swiftly follows birth here, separated by a very short yet definitive dash. Next, Welty uses long dashes when she says, they was about this long, pardon. Her use of long dashes act to give the reader a visual reference for how long the twins were. Welty also chose to have two dashes, one for each twin, although they are conjoined. She separates the dashes with the word pardon, which separates the twins and gives them each an identity. The final long dash in the passage sets off the phrase, and they had these two heads and two faces and four arms and four legs. The actual list of features here would be normal for a set of twins, but because they are con connected by the ands, they begin to run together as they do with the conjoined twins. The italicized here in the poem indicates that Leota made a gesture to show how the two twins were joined together. The emphasis on here also serves the purpose of reminding the reader that the setting of Petrified Man is in the beauty parlor. This refocus begins, the sh begins to shift the attention back to Mrs. Fletcher and her own pregnancy. Welty captures the transience of a small moment in Petrified Man through her use of dialogue and colloquialisms between Leota and Mrs. Fletcher, but she also captures a brief moment by having the twins on display within a jar. Welty's decision to preserve the twins encouraged the reader to reconsider what the process of life entails and forces Mrs. Fletcher to confront the reality of her own pregnancy as well.